Okay, field theory. The one thing that I've asked a billion people to define that nobody can define. Now, there are two types of geometry. There's spatial geometry, which is Euclidean geometry, and then there's trans-Euclidean geometry, or counterspace. Uh, Rudolf Steiner actually coined the term counterspace, but the Greeks uh, had another term for it. It was the ether. Um, there, of course, there have been a thousand theories on the ether, but just because there's a thousand theories on the ether does uh, not discount the fact that since 80% of them or more were nonsense, that certainly does not discount the ether. So, what are the differences that define the two? Now, as I've spoken about before, and which will be in the fourth edition of the free book, Uncovering Missing Secrets of Magnetism, we have two different, geometries, two different geometries to deal with. Now, it is an undeniable, irrefutable fact that 100% of the universe, the visible universe, uh, the existential, empirical, phenomenal universe, is uh, such due to magnetism. The only thing that gives volume and definition from the macro and atomic scale, uh, from the micro to the macro, is magnetism. The divergent, reciprocating, centrifugal loss of inertia, which follows the Poincaré, that's P-O-I-N-C-A-R-E, Hanley Poincaré disk model, which is a three-dimensional projection of a two-dimensional um, uh, two uh, loss of inertia. Actually, he used it to define something else, but magnetism does follow that. It follows a holographic-like projection of the loss of inertia, and it must necessitatively the Greeks were famous, and this term is untranslatable, it's translated as necessity. You know, just like saying that uh, if you pour water downhill, then necessitatively it rolls downhill rather than uphill. Uh, obviously due to gravity, but uh, gravity does not exist. Well, obviously, that which we call gravity certainly exists, but it's nothing other than dielectric acceleration. Um, what the hell, this is a little Toro flux, by the way, T-O-R-O-F-L-U-X, it's a little toy. It uh, shows you a toroidal geometry. And now if you look underneath the ferro cell, uh, end on or on the side, you'll actually see a torus. So we're going to uh, define electrical geometry. Okay. Now if you look at the cross section of AC current that's running down AC line, you'll actually see the same thing. You'll actually see expanding circles from AC current line, you know, running down every street, expanding this way. That's the magnetic current. Okay. And then you have the dielectric which is between those two, but the counter volume, the negative image of the toroid, this is a toroid, i.e. the donut shape, the negative image of that is the hyperboloid, which finds inertia and increasing acceleration. So what is the opposite? You see, Mother Nature is not a cross-eyed hooker on crack with a calculator, okay? Now, I know that sounds really funky, and other people have kind of amused at it, but it, it actually means something deep. And what that means is exactly what I said. Mother Nature is not a cross-eyed hooker on crack, as quantum mechanics would have you believe, nor does she have a calculator. The only thing she understands is force and motion and inertia and acceleration. Divergent magnetism and returning centripetal convergent. But that isn't magnetism, that's increasing inertia and acceleration. The same thing I showed you with that thousand dollar monster magnet, where you actually have, well it's the same Galazine flux at the center, has a completely different uh, qualitative property to the magnetism on the centrifugal divergent edge, because that centrifugal divergent edge is the point of maximum loss of inertia, the centrifugal uh, curve linear motion which uh, reciprocates you know what reciprocating means, I hope to God. Reciprocates transversely to the other side. Follows exactly the Henri Poincaré disk model. So we have two different geometries. Obviously, you take a, you know, a billion atoms of anything or a trillion billion and it'll eventually make a sphere. So it is the nature of uh, the, uh, the microscopic world. If you get enough accumulation, you will develop a sphere. So what is the electrical geometry that defines Euclidean and trans-Euclidean geometry? Obviously, that which gives volume to everything is magnetism. But what... You know, all geometry starts at a point, and of course a point is a locus. It is not a point in space. Space is a posterior attribute of the effect is literally the horse crap, of, if you will, of magnetism. What do you define as spatial geometry? Well, here in the torus we have space, but, you know, there's no field that has ever terminated in the space. 
space itself is the after effect, the shadow of a divergent loss of inertia which defines the centrifugal uh, uh, reciprocation of a magnetic field. Whether it's macro or micro doesn't make any difference. This is the same reason why no electrical phenomena, dielectric, electrical, or magnetic, has ever terminated in space because space is not a terminal. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, how are you going to uh, light your light bulb? Are you going to plug it into space? You know, there is no energy there. Uh, it does not exist. Space is literally absence of inertia. That divergent centrifugal magnetism obviously creates space, but space is nothing. It is not a principle in itself. It is a privation. You know, you cannot say that a shadow does something because a shadow is an absence. It is a privation. See, this is something the ancient Greek Platonists and the Indians understood very well. But modern Western minds are really, 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 really damn stupid. I mean, just, you know, this Descartian atomism. I mean, when I refer to Mother Nature being a cross-eyed hooker on crack, I'm referring to quantum mechanics that believes everything in the universe is mediated by a Tiny little particles, muons, gluons, uh, virtual particles, uh, graviton. You know, all of this is the most rank BS that is imaginable. I mean, this is this is absurd as uh, uh, unicorn farts and fairy dust. I mean, to even believe in such an absurdity. Everything in the universe is fields, and fields are not particles. There is nothing that can be quantified, i.e. quantity or quantum, uh, as regards to a field, whether it's dielectric, electrical, or magnetic, or gravitational. And gravity itself does not exist. Well, obviously gravity exists. I mean, I drop this, it's going to fall towards the Earth. So obviously it exists. But what is it? It's not an autonomous. We know it's not a force. I mean, if you drop anything, you're not applying any force for that to accelerate to terminal velocity. It is an acceleration. An acceleration is an increase towards inertia. So what is gravity specifically, if we are to get very specific and denotative? Gravity is dielectric acceleration. That which the common stupid dumb human calls magnetic attraction, okay, is dielectric acceleration. It is no different than gravity. So, how do we think about this? We have two different geometries. We have electrical and field geometry, and we have Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is very simply uh, extrapolated, uh, you know, by every, you know, possible, uh, you know, uh, form of mathematics. We even understanding it is not that difficult. You know, why, you know, why to, does enough matter eventually form a sphere? Well, if you actually take a wafer magnet and break it and then break it and break it again, it'll actually form a sphere too because a magnetic attraction which is not magnetic attraction at all, it's dielectric acceleration, absolutely 100% no different than gravity, operates the same way. Instead of having like a huge mass, you have to get masses larger than an asteroid uh, for a matter to form perfect little spheres. Now if you actually sit there and hammer on a magnet, like a take away from magnet, it'll form, you know, it'll be jagged, but if you keep hammering on it, it'll actually form a ball. And the reason why it's able to do that is because it has co field coherency. Same thing that differentiates a light from a laser is the same thing that differentiates a, a neodymium iron boron slug uh, from a neodymium iron boron magnet because it has been magnetized. It has an increased dielectric capacitance and it has field coherency. The entire, uh, you know, endless billions of atoms that are found in a neodymium iron boron magnet operate as a single. Uh, hyperboloid torus. Now the magnetic field exists exactly like this, curvilinear divergent centrifugal magnetism. And as I showed you in the prior videos using that monster magnet, what exists at the center is not the same thing that exists over here. But a uh, Gauss meter will never tell you that. It only uh, understands a Gaussian flux. But uh, the magnetism that exists out here is not the same as it exists over here. So. Obviously, gravity uh, is, let's just call it gravity for right now, okay? Everything, well, when you're talking about dielectric acceleration, it's the same thing that you call magnetic attraction. Gravity does not exist. That which we call gravity is no different than magnetic attraction. And it uh, is not magnetic attraction, nor is gravity gravity. It is all one thing and one thing only. Mother Nature is really, really damn simple. And humans are really, really, really damn stupid. And what that is, is dielectric acceleration. So let's use an analogy to actually plant it in your mind for you to understand. We obviously have a torus here. We have centrifugal divergent magnetism. We know the inverse image of that is the hyperboloid, which defines 
increasing inertia and acceleration. So if we're able to use the dielectric acceleration of the Earth on this steel object and apply it along a central axis, we'll have a model of exactly how a magnet operates. Okay, so instead of imagining this huge ass pole here, let's just imagine this pole is invisible. Okay, put that in your brain first off. Imagine this pole is invisible. So obviously gravity, dielectric acceleration is pulling on this entire thing, but if I'm able to direct it only through the center where the hyperboloid exists, what we're able to do is recreate how a coherent magnet works. Because what defines a magnet is no different quantitatively than the pre-magnet. The only difference is a qualitative difference of field coherency. So, let's take a look. Let's just imagine this pole doesn't exist. This is the exact same sort of field dynamics that exist in a magnet. Except now, in addition to imagining that this pole doesn't exist, you're going to have to imagine that we have a, a counter, a centrifugal and a centripetal uh, torus here, but you have to actually imagine another one superimposed on this. This one is going clockwise. We have to imagine a counterclockwise one interlaced. So if you can imagine two of these toral fluxes perfectly interlaced, one going one direction, the other one going the other direction, then you will have exactly what magnetic field trans-Euclidean geometry is like. Now, obviously, the torus is Euclidean geometry, but it follows the Henri Poincaré disk model of projective geometry. But what we have at the center as seen under any ferro cell, and as accurately predicted by me in my model and the math on what defines uh, magnetism and how it works, is we have the hyperboloid. The negative image of this torus right here in the center, shaped exactly like an hourglass. You know what an hourglass is shaped like? Okay. Looks like a Lorenzian attractor, too. If you actually calculate out the dielectric flux flow, it looks like a Lorenzian attractor in two dimensions. But if you project that out, it, it follows the path of hyperboloid. Oh my god, what a shocker. So imagine these two of these toroflux fluxes interlaced. Now, obviously, I'm uh, directing the dielectric acceleration along the center axis. Obviously, uh, the dielectric acceleration of the Earth towards this metal uh, torus is pulling downwards on the entire mass but I'm directing it through the hyperboloid so I can replicate what magnetic flux looks like. Now the equation, which I have tattooed in my hand by the way, is 1 over 5 to the power of negative 3. Oh my god, golden ratio, 4.23606. People think that's a number, it's not. It's actually an expression of the natural loss of inertia. It is, as the Greeks would call it, ananke. Now, you can't translate that word. There's an entire book written about the Greek word ananke. It is untranslatable. Just as the Greek word logos is really untranslatable. It is translated ananke as necessity, but it really means something a whole lot more than that. So I'm directing the dielectric acceleration, i.e. increasing centripetal uh, convergence along the hyperboloid center to the torus, or the donut shape here. And this is exactly how the field mechanics of a magnet works. So you're going to have to do two things in your mind. I'm sorry I can't duplicate this with a real world model. You're going to have to mentally eliminate this pole from your head as if it were invisible and you're going to have to superimpose superimpose in your mind a uh, another torus another toroflux uh, except in the inverse dimension to this one so they're both rolling except one inverse to the other one is centrifugal reciprocating and on this side we have a centrifugal in the inverse direction reciprocating and this of course gets into defining polarity because that's something else human beings don't understand and of course I, I illuminate it in the fourth edition of the book on magnetism actually, actually what denotes and defines polarity because it is certainly not what uh, us uh, crazy human beings. Well pole means it has an orbit, and that's a description that's not an explanation what defines polarity is one thing very simply, and most people don't get this when I tell them that. Polarity is the loss of inertia which defines divergence. Okay? Because Mother Nature only knows how to draw a line one way. So human beings, we draw a line like this. Here, 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 here. Mother Nature only knows how to draw a line one way. Like this. Okay? That's the only way Mother Nature knows how to... The loss of inertia is defined by the appearance of polarization. Because Mother Nature doesn't draw a line like this, or like this, or like this, or like, like us stupid humans. That's a human line. Mother Nature's line is like this. Okay? If you understand that, you'll really, really, really have a firm grasp on what the hell defines magnetism. 
Mother Nature only knows how to make a line like this. Because we have a zero point here, which a point is really a bad term, but human conceptual understanding is phenomenal. We can't understand trans-Euclidean geometry. Humans only understand geometry. I can eat it, I can screw it, I can spend it, I can buy it. That's all geometric. Okay? All geometry comes from an unmanifest point, and even point is a bad term, and that point is counter space, i.e. inertia, i.e. the ether. I don't give a damn if you call it the ether, I don't care if you call it counter space, or trans-Euclidean geometry, or inertia, it is all the same damn thing with different names applied to it. Even the assholes of quantum mechanics admit to the ether, but the word ether is evil to them. So what do they do? All they did is just rebrand it. Now they're calling it quantum fluid. Well, asshole, uh, the attributes that you give to quantum fluid is exactly the same as ether. Oh, no, ether's an evil word. We can't use the word. Oh, no, ether. Ah! That is literally like the antichrist word uh, to these assholes, these idiots in uh, quantum mechanics. You can't say ether. Ah! Oh, we're really using ether. We said we just renamed it as quantum fluid. Well, great, idiot. Instantaneous action. I mean, they know all this stuff is mediated out by fields. Okay? Except idiots like Einstein and a few others have tried to reify space as something that does something. And this is the same reason why Tesla called Einstein a long, fuzzy haired crackpot for reifying space as having properties. Tesla said this was the most. Tesla called this an insanity that was doomed to oblivion. And you know what? Tesla is a whole damn lot smarter than that idiot, that asshole Einstein ever was. Einstein in German, by the way, means one stone, which is slang for stupid. One stone in German is a euphemism for stupid. So even Einstein's own name in his, in his native land of Deutschland means stupid. Einstein, you're, it, it's the same thing as being named idiot, except in German. Einstein, one stone, moron, idiot. Oi. Even his name says what he is. So anyway, enough ragging on the moron Einstein. So do you understand this? Do you understand Euclidean, trans-Euclidean geometry? The fact that we have two geometries, Euclidean, trans-Euclidean, one defines space and geometries in space, and the other one finds electrical and field geometries, and that would be the torus and the hyperboloid. Obviously the torus is a spatial geometry, but that is because it is magnetic based. And the hyperboloid, which defines the dielectric, the increasing acceleration, is that which defines inertia, i.e. counter space. Okay? Why do you think, if you take this as a sphere and superimpose a sphere on top of this, uh, hyper, uh, this torus, why do you think uh, the, uh, the northern lights occur? They occur on both poles, of course. Why do you think they occur? The Earth obviously has not only a spherical geometry, it has a magnetic geometry. Why do you think that, uh, that the uh, northern lights appear here, and they also appear on the southern pole, except not many people live on the south, obviously. You know, why do you think they appear here and here? Oh my god, that's the point of, you know, where things go. We have a vortex, uh, an entry point, which is the beginning of the hyperboloid, which defines the entry point that gives a uh, definition to those uh, noble gases uh, which uh, light up uh, the northern sky and the southern sky which nobody really sees except for a few Tasmanians I believe. I think the Tasmanians and some uh, people in the uh, very far south uh, South America are able to see them but anyway. Euclidean geometry, trans-Euclidean geometry. We have three things that define it. The sphere, the torus, and the hyperboloid. The torus and the hyperboloid define electrical geometry and trans-Euclidean geometry. The sphere obviously defines Euclidean geometry. Thanks for watching. I hope that made things slightly clearer. Although most people will say, you just confused me. You've made it more confusing. <laughs>